All right. I'm making videos about my new book. I just got it. Um, it was just delivered. I sat down here and decided to make quick videos of each chapter. I'm going through it. This is toward the end. I'm talking about theme five. I have five main themes through the book. I talk about frugality or making stuff with not a lot of money. Uh, exploring technology, kind of learning the guts of technology. Building identities is a cluster of chapters that talks about um, exploring who you are through uh, DIY electronics. And then kind of disobedient electronics, stuff that's done uh, out of protest. The fifth chapter, I only have one chapter on this, is Selling Out and Graffiti Writer, a project by Rich Pell and others at the, their group is called the Institute for Applied Autonomy. Um, it's about the idea of creating uh, tech and artists and how they sometimes inspire, sometimes are ripped off, sometimes are sold, some, and sometimes collaborate with scientists, engineers, and industry. Uh, in some cases, artists do that willingly. In other cases, it's kind of taken from them. Um, but it's kind of a theme that I see uh, in the world of electronic art and media art and experimental electronics. You often have these subcultural things that are taken into mainline culture and they explode and make lots of money. So I wanted to, I'd only seen really Golan Levin write about this in the past. Um, and I wanted to kind of explore this through a case study on the graffiti writer. So um, I title this co-option and DIY electronics is unpaid industrial R and D. Now the graffiti writer uh, was a, machine that could write and spray paint graffiti on the ground um, by the Institute for Applied Autonomy and it, it would travel along and spray paint on the ground and write out messages. So it worked like a remote controlled kind of truck, had spray cans on the back and you could write in your message and it would zip along and write it on the ground. Um, here's another video of it. Um, it, this was built with a parallax basic stamp microprocessor, a 16 K of memory, uh, solenoids, LEDs, um, kind of homebrew, uh, DIY kind of before the emergence of the Arduino. Here you can see it kind of like spray painting a uh, town square um, in Stuttgart in 1999. So what I, I and this is really kind of like a culture jamming uh, tactical kind of uh, approach that Institute for Applied Autonomy used. They actually talked about this as, they termed it as contestational robotics. Um, and it was made to be engineer, engineered to be deployed in, you know, live public space. And it was successful. It got, it had, um, you know, and it sort of creates this almost like fake company, Institute for Applied Autonomy, a little bit like how SRL is sort of, or Mewa Denki is our, our companies that kind of are art groups and kind of projects more than money-making exercise. Um, And it function it works on function, and this way it's different than critical design. It, it's incredibly functional, and wants to be deployed in the real world, uh, like a lot of these other projects. So, um, so what happened to this project? They ended up doing this smaller graffiti robot for several years. Um, it was in shows, it won awards, and all that kind of stuff. They extended it to make this kind of like van system. 
uh, no more prisons. So they're doing, you know, they're, that's what they wrote there. They're doing kind of political stuff. Um, then what happened, and I don't have a picture of it here, but what happened is that Nike, and you can search this on the internet, if you search for Nike Chalkbot, is a machine that was licensed. To the, that What ended up happening is one person from the team, uh, unbeknownst to the entire team, went off and basically proposed to Nike to use this in a large advertising campaign, and it got picked up by none other than the Livestrong, I don't know if anybody remembers Livestrong, um, from this era, uh, the Livestrong campaign and the uh, Tour de France. Um, and it was made into a machine that take, took this idea exactly pretty much as this this kind of collective had um, developed and sold it to Nike. And it was a smashing success. Now, of course, it's complicated. And I, I'm not really friends with these folks in, in, a, in a thorough way. And I don't really intend for this to be, a, you know, a rip apart of who did what and who said what or whatever. Um, these things happen regularly. Teams of nonprofit kind of uh, inventions and stuff like this, people go off and sell it. They need to pay bills and they need to make money. But this trend in general of artwork getting uh, taken by industry, kind of outsider kind of inventions being used by industry is, is something that is <laughs> something that artists need to deal with. Um, that what happened is that actually the, so the original kind of art group was sort of angry that one of their members went off and basically sold it to Nike. Um, what, what the Institute for Applied Autonomy, the, the, the uh, graffiti uh, writer, developer said, is that they wanted the group, the, the Nike, to publish their plans and code in keeping with open source. So they felt that their work was open source and they wanted that to be maintained as it was commercialized. That wasn't done. Uh, th and that, that's a common clause in a lot of open source hardware projects that if it's open source, you want it to stay open source. Um, also, to prominently feature a historical accounting of technical and ideological origins of the robot on their website. So they wanted credit, you know. They're, they're not looking for a bunch of money here, but they do want to be credited with, uh, they want to see what they had done with the idea, and they wanted uh, credit. Um, and they wanted that machine to be able to be used by, uh, by other people. And they uh, wanted some of the money to go back that was generated out of that to go back into community projects. Um, and I'm proposing this as kind of like an approach, not saying that this is how it has to be done, but this is kind of what I, IA, Institute for Applied Autonomy, uh, did. Um, and I refer to a number of projects that Golan Levin talks about. Myron Kruger's 1974 work was copied by Sony Itoid in 2003. Michael Neymark's work from 1978 was taken by Google Street View in 2007. Art Plus Com's 1996 work was copied by Google Earth in 2001. And Chris O'Shea's work, 2009 work was copied by Forever 21 in 2010. So this is not specifically only about graffiti writer, but it tries to address the idea of intellectual property and commercialization of work because DIY work generally matures and generally gets co-opted into more professional forms of production. So I use the chalkbot and the graffiti writer as a case study to explore some of this stuff and to show this interesting work from the Institute for Applied Autonomy. And that is that chapter, theme number five in Art and DIY Electronics, available from MIT Press.